My first guest in the Plant Blindness series is Associate Professor Monica Gagliano, who is the Senior Research Fellow in Plant Behaviour at the University of Sydney. Monica is a critically important person in plant studies because she has published many peer-reviewed articles in science journals on the exceptional attributes and qualities of the behaviour of plants. But in addition to this, she has really contributed a massive amount in terms of conferences and symposia and just gathering together disparate people from different humanities disciplines and working together with all those different silos to create what really is critical plant studies. So Monica's work in plant behaviour is really quite an exciting and radical change in the way we understand plants because of her work with plant cognition, which includes things like learning and memory and intelligence and communication and perception and behaviour, we now understand what we sort of already intuitively suspected, which is that we have underestimated um, the relevance and importance of the way plants function. So as a result of her plant science work and all her publications in that area, and her work bringing together all the different humanities scholars together, including writers and poets and artists. She has really been a critical figure in this critical plant studies field. And more recently, she published a book called Thus Spoke the Plant. And in this book, she has really documented her own very personal journey with plants and really communicated to her audience and to her readers how she has worked alongside plants and spoken with plants and how that has really informed the decisions she's made in terms of her research, both in the laboratory and in the field and in terms of all her collaborative work with humanities scholars, artists and writers. So Monica, my first question today for you is why are we so concerned with plant behaviour and why is that really important today in this epoch of climate change? Hmm. Hello. <laughs> I guess the question would be why on earth did we not get concerned about this before, really? Yeah. It's like uh, we have assumed for, for a while that plants are not uh, capable of the things that they are capable of despite the obvious. Mm. So the question will be like, why have we ignored the obvious? Mm. And in, in particular this time, I guess uh, our ignorance is no longer uh, justified because science is clearly showing that uh, plants can do plenty of things. Uh, but also it's uh, very dangerous mm. and of course in the context of plant blindness our ignorance is very dangerous as you know because it means that we just don't care. And why has it been so <coughs> important that plant science catches up with what we, we as humans intuitively suspected? Putting aside the fact that we have, you know, as, as a, a huge condition of being human perhaps neglected or overlooked mm. the importance of plants. Why has it taken your work in the laboratory in terms of the facts and hard evidence mm -hmm. of science? Why, why has that been so important? Well, I guess uh, science, at least for the last couple of uh, centuries, mm. uh, has had uh, an important voice and, uh, and <laughs> more or less still does. Mm. And, uh, and I guess uh, for us to, to hear certain things from this perspective, so mm. from the scientific perspective, it kind of gives validity. This is our culture, yeah. you know, like our culture uh, wants validation through science. And so uh, one uh, side effect of, of that, and it's, there is nothing wrong with that, mm. is, but one side effect of that is, that of course, some of the knowledge that has been available to us for a long time, mm. where there is uh, clearly indigenous knowledge, but also just simple folklore, um, it's been kind of dismissed, uh, belittled, and sometimes completely ignored. And uh, so in a way, um, science, yeah, needed to do a lot of catch up. Mm. And, uh, and it needed to do it in a, in a, in a very strict and uh, very, um, yeah, serious way. Mm. Uh, 
so that it, it wouldn't just be belittled and swept away like uh, he has done before with other forms of knowledge. Mm. And, uh, and I guess um, because science in our culture, in our modern culture, has got such a strong voice still, uh, for science to say, hey, you know, plants have something to say, uh, plants are doing things, uh, plants know, plants perceive, they behave, uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's quite a something. Because now people feel like, oh, so I can pay attention. This is actually real. Mm. So I can see a huge problem for both the science communities and the humanities communities yeah. already in the way we're talking about this material. Because we're using anthropocentric language and anthropomorphizing language. In other words, we can't, we don't seem to be able to find the right lexicon or the right language to discuss this crossover between plant science and the humanities. And that seems to be a problem or so an obstacle to overcome in terms of communicating the important work that you do. Mm. And I know you've, um, you've edited several volumes on this very topic, this problem of having an appropriate language for plant science. How do we go forward with that in terms of finding a new lexicon without just slipping back into that human-centric, I don't know what you would call it, like just a, yeah. a pool of rubbish, do you know what I mean? How do we, how do we overcome that problem? Well, actually, uh, I, I would overcome it by just saying that we don't need to. Okay. And uh, what I mean by that is like, uh, we don't need new language. We, the language that we have is very appropriate. Mm. It's just that it's being loaded mm. with specific meaning and uh, for example, you know, one classical term, learning, you know, and I know that, you know, uh, with my work, plenty of people within the scientific uh, arena, but I'm sure also in the humanity, disagree that uh, learning is not the appropriate word. Learning, you shouldn't call it learning. This mm. is not learning. But what uh, we are missing is like, well, what, what is learning? Or decision making is another one, similar. It's like, what is learning? What does decision making mean? And when you actually look at what the word of itself means, you realize that, like, oh, well, decision making, uh, you are choosing between things. Learning is about uh, choosing again. Mm. And uh, so if I, put, uh, uh, I create a situation where a plant can uh, show me that, and it goes through a test, and it shows me that, and if there was a, a mouse, it would do the exactly the same test and mm. it would show the same things. Well, then the mouse and the plant are actually doing the same thing. Mm. And so the term actually describes the right process. The anthropocentric and anthropomorphic aspect of this is actually uh, not, uh, for me, um, from my perspective, it's not about using the word learning applied to plants. Mm. It's about the fact that we actually uh, are so anthropocentric that we think that learning belongs to us and a few species that we endow with that yes. uh, quality. Yes. And, uh, and that's what needs to be dismantled. That is, the language has been colonized by our own you know, uh, approach. Mm. And I think the language is perfectly appropriate, but is, it needs to be decolonized. Okay. So, as you know, I wrote about one of your experiments in the conversation, yep. that platform. Um, the Pavlovian P. The, the Pavlovian P, which is such an interesting experiment. And so many people, I've explained what the work that you were doing, and I'd love you to just explain it for us today as well. But often when I would describe what you were doing, there would be a pause, and they would say, but wait a minute, what? And I, and I know what the problem is. And it is, this is the radical part of, mm -hmm. of your work, that everything you're doing, everything you're um, proving and experimenting, and your hypothesis that you're working through slowly in the laboratory and in that very organised and controlled way, comes up with a result that none of us suspected. And actually, more importantly, that when we, when we really reflect on your results, it's so radical because... And, and, and the people that I talk to about this are sometimes like, they don't quite know what's missing. And of course, you know what's missing. Yeah. The brain. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit, for instance, about the Pavlovian P experiment mm -hmm. so that um, we can better understand how radical that work is? Mm. I mean, as you know, the Pavlovian dog yes. is the famous one. 
and uh, and the story is pretty simple. You know, Pavlov uh, mm, noticed that you know the dog kind of seems to anticipate dinner mm -hmm. or the arrival of dinner, and uh, so the the story goes that uh, he had this bell and he will ring the bell before presenting the dinner, and uh, and he did it a few times, and after a while the dog uh, being presented always with the bell, and then the dinner started to kind of realize uh, that, oh, wait a second, whenever the bell rings, food is coming. And so eventually Pablo just rang the bell and no food was coming, but the dog started salivating, really demonstrate like, I know what's coming next, even if there is no trace of dinner yeah. around me. So the experiment with the Pavlovian pea was exactly the same. Of course, mm. uh, peas don't eat the same dinner as dogs. <laughs> so the dinner for the pea in my experiment was blue light. Mm. And the equivalent of the bell uh, was uh, a little fan. And uh, just like in the dog, the, the bell in it of itself didn't have any meaning to start with. It only becomes meaningful to the dog because it's associated to dinner. And that's the fundamental of associative learning. Now, um, in the same situation with the pea and the blue light and the, and the fan, the fan of itself doesn't do anything. Mm. But when, once it's presented a few times and it's always followed by the blue light, which is what the pea really wants, uh, the fan alone, just like the dog with the bell, uh, would trigger the response from the pea and the pea would move and grow towards the direction that the fan is indicating, which basically means the P is expecting light to follow from that direction. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, um, is counter to what the P would, should normally do in terms of like just a reactive, innative, you know, like mm -hmm. a reflex. The normal reflex would be to move and grow towards the- Away from the wind. Yeah, and the yeah. last place where you saw the light. Yeah. But I'm asking them like, yeah, that's one option. I'm asking you to, Follow this fan. If mm. you understood what the fan actually predicts, so if the, the, there is a meaning or a value given to the fan, then I, you should be following the fan because that's where the light is really going to mm. come from. And th that's exactly what the peas do. Mm. So you see, when we think of, uh, of the dog mm. and the dog learning and associating and giving value, uh, what we are really thinking, what is the, the reason why that is totally plausible for us, aside from our own personal experience, if mm. you have a dog, you know that, uh, but it's the fact that it's got a brain yeah. and it's got a nervous system. And there is a whole, we have a, a, a history, recent, quite recent, but still quite dominant, and tr the traditional view of cognition is, uh, is being based on the fact that the brain is the thing yeah, that the centerpiece. makes, you know, learning that allows and uh, without it you can't have these uh, cognitive processes going on. So this is the, the radical element of, of your work and the implications of your work are quite intimidating I suppose for a lot of <laughs> us because okay so plants don't have brains, um, they don't have a nervous system but now we seem to understand that there is this for want of a better expression a kind of distributed intelligence across the vegetable world, mm -hmm. how, what, what's, the, what's the trajectory for you and in just maybe just in terms of your thinking rather than, I mean, I'd like to hear about your next experiment, mm -hmm. but before we do that, what's your thinking then and uh, how do we, how on earth do we make sense of this, Monica? Yeah. You know, in terms of, if, if we now understand that there might be an intelligence that sits definitely outside the brain mm -hmm. or at least outside the human brain, outside the human nervous system or the animal nervous system. Mm -hmm. Is this just too much for us to take? Well, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, uh, I have experienced plenty of um, resistance. Uh, vitriol in, on yeah, occasion even. Yeah, you know, so a lot of, definitely a lot of passive aggressive, yeah. which is usually the most uh, common. Yeah. Um, I guess the the, the idea that uh, the brain is the thing mm. that allows for these um, you know, processes from learning to decision making, uh, behavior in general, mm. uh, it's, 
it's a very obviously it's a very ingrained and dominant view mm. that's why we're having problems like we feel you know mm. um, but it's a kind of quite recent aspect of our understanding and our thinking too is in like terms of philosophy or science uh, both yeah. the philosophy first yeah. and there is you know this entire um, cognitivist approach mm. uh, which actually emerged out of cybernetics in the 60s mm. and this is interesting for me because he emerged out of a field that was looking at machines mm. you know the first computers mm. and uh, and then we kind of try to understand ourselves and animals mm. uh, based on on that mm. and and of course a computer is a machine that works uh, and is based and it does an amazing job if the world was a digital world yeah and so is interested in parts and is uh, you know there is an input a processor the brain and then an output which is the behavior it's a very linear, very comfortable, mm. you know, yeah. explanation. Soothing. Yeah, and it feels comfortable, and it's uh, I understand, and mm. and uh, we've seen it uh, working mm. in many places. So nothing wrong with that. But the world is not digital. The world is analog, mm. which means that there is no black and white. There is no one two. There is no A B. There is a you know, a lot of grey shade in the middle of all of that and the white, who knows what the white really is and what the black really is. And so when we apply the real world to this kind of uh, framework that is, you know, very linear, it's kind of a little bit too simplistic, I guess. Mm. And uh, beside um, the, what the plant studies now are showing or are threatening mm. <laughs> is the fact that it's like, uh, well, cognition can happen without the brain mm. and this is like this is science yeah so when we are met with a with a fact with a with evidence with data mm. that show that something is not quite right with your theory <laughs> or something that your theory can't account for mm. well you need to revise the theory yeah and so this is this is the trajectory for you this is mm -hmm. this is the fascinating kind of magical conjecture about where we're going to go next in terms of your work as, as a plant behaviour scientist and then our humanity's job, which mm -hmm. I see as you know, communicating, representing or expressing mm -hmm. what you're doing in a way that can make sense to a, a wider audience, perhaps outside mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. So how does, why is plant blindness important then? Uh, I know it's a term that you are very familiar with and understand deeply. What can we do and how can we do it, you know, in terms of what you're, the radical work that you are doing? Why is, it, why is it important to make change? Why is it important for human perceptions and therefore, you know, perception important, mm -hmm. behaviour output? Why mm -hmm. is it important for humans to change our perception and then subsequently change our behaviour? 